Good morning. I am pleased to uh, be joined uh, by our distinguished uh, caucus leader, Jim Clyburn, and uh, Vice Chair Javier Becerra. Uh, more than 200 days have uh, gone by, and still the number one concern in our caucus is the lack of jobs. Again, it's our intent uh, throughout the break, if there is one, uh, that we will be going back home in our districts and uh, talking about the need for jobs and the lack of a jobs agenda that has emanated uh, from the halls of this Congress by our colleagues across the way. Carolyn Maloney of our caucus made an interesting statement uh, the other day. Uh, she was reflecting on the process that we have uh, begun to call Groundhog Day now here in our caucus. You keep repeating the same thing over and over and over again. And we've seen this show uh, before. Uh, we can go back to uh, 2008 when the Republican caucus then went against their own Fed chief and against their own president and reneged on a deal. Uh, they, and uh, Jim is eminently aware of the deal that was being constructed uh, by him and Chris Van Hollen that uh, Eric Cantor walked away from, uh, the vice president. And then they walked away from Senator McConnell, who had laid out an alternative plan, along with uh, a reluctant Harry Reid, but in the process to move the nation forward and take us away from this economic disaster, they walked out on that deal. Then they walked out on a bipartisan deal that was put forward between Democrats and Republicans in the House. They walked away from that apparently because they've all taken a pledge to Grover uh, Norquist and not, well, I thought we took a pledge to the, uh, uh, to the flag under the Pledge of Allegiance to the country. But nonetheless, they walked out on that uh, relationship. They then further, the, John Boehner walked away from the president's proposal. And now we find, lo and behold, this week that the Republicans have walked away from even John Boehner's proposal. So as we sit here frustrated, wanting to move forward, our caucus continues to think that perhaps the best thing to do is put a clean vote up there and take this cup away from the American people. They are pushing the American people. This is not just about the global economy, nor is it about just our national economy, as important as that is. This is about household economies. This is about 401ks becoming 101ks. Increasingly, we're getting calls to our office saying, what should I do with my money? What's going on? How serious is this event? What do we need to do? And during our caucus, one of the great wise heads of our caucus stood up and said, I'll tell you what we need to do. We need to have the president look at all of his options. And with that, I'll call on our leader, Jim Clyburn, to explain what he said to our caucus. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chair. I uh, think all of us are quite aware uh, that the American people are now tuned in, big time, as we say, uh, to this issue. And they are very, very concerned about whether or not uh, their retirement checks uh, are going to continue uh, to flow and uh, hold their value. Uh, they are concerned as to whether or not uh, their children uh, are going to be in positions uh, to continue the pursuit uh, of their education. Uh, their concern, their mortgages that they hold on their homes and whether or not uh, what we're doing here uh, threaten uh, the validity uh, of those uh, transactions. And so I have said to my caucus and I've said to, uh, to others uh, that anything short uh, of a long-term uh, raising of the debt ceiling, something that gets us uh, through the next election, something uh, that will bring stability uh, to our communities as well uh, as to Wall Street. Anything less than that 
And I'm hearing this morning uh, about a 30-day extension, uh, some say a six-month extension uh, of the debt ceiling. I don't think that will do what needs to be done uh, for the American people and for this great uh, economy uh, of ours. And so I would say uh, to the President uh, that if that's what lands on his desk, a short-term lifting of the ceiling, of the debt ceiling, he should put it on his desk next to an executive order that he will have drawn up. And with the same pen that he vetoes that short-term debt leaving, uh, ceiling uh, extension, he should sign an executive order invoking the 14th Amendment uh, to this issue. I am convinced uh, that whatever uh, discussions about the, the legality of that can continue. Uh, but I believe uh, that something like this will bring calm uh, to the American people and uh, will bring uh, needed uh, stability uh, to our financial markets. So uh, I think that that's the position we're in, uh, and I know his reluctance uh, to do that but I will remind you in closing uh, that back in our history, back in the 1940s, a great debate was raging in this country as to whether or not it made sense to integrate the armed services. Congress wouldn't do it. President Truman did so by executive order. And that executive order still holds today. And if we can do something as big uh, as bringing uh, stability to our security, as we did with armed services, we can do something big now. And so I would say to the President uh, that uh, short-term extension ought to be out. He ought to veto it if it comes to him, and with the same pen, sign an executive order invoking the 14th Amendment. With that, I'll yield to the Vice Chair. I think a very clear message should be issued to Speaker John Boehner. Mr. Speaker, House Republicans have failed to govern. Failure is not an option for our country. And therefore, you leave it to the President to take whatever action is within his power by his right under the Constitution to move this country forward and make sure Americans do not suffer the consequences of your failure. George Washington did not let a winter's cold deny the people of the colonies the chance to be the United States of America. Abraham Lincoln didn't allow the intransigence of a people from keeping this country together. John Kennedy didn't stop the threat of nuclear war from keeping this country safe. And Barack Obama should not allow an economic crisis caused by the contrivance of House Republicans through their intransigence to vote to do what they did for George Bush and for Ronald Reagan, keep the American people from being able to pay their mortgage, send their kids to college, keep their retirement accounts at full value, and keep the dollar at its true value. And that's what's at stake. At the end of the day, should Americans find that they are paying a higher mortgage because of the contrivance of Republicans on this issue of the default crisis? Should Americans find that their retirement accounts drop as they saw them drop three years ago during the Wall Street meltdown, drop again because of the contrivance of Republicans on this default crisis? And should Americans deprive their children of going to college because they can't borrow the money to send them to a good school because of the contrivance of Republicans in this default crisis? Mr. President, uh, other presidents have taken the lead. We believe that Republicans, through their failures here, give you very little option but to take the lead. And we hope that Republicans will understand that the American people are telling them, you're not handling this the right way and we need someone to step forward.
Thank you, Javier. And I will just uh, sum up by saying, uh, and I think they're the most poignant thing that has been said to me during this whole discussion is a woman from my district who said, what is it that people don't understand in Washington, D.C., that we are being pushed up against the dark abyss of uncertainty as it relates to our livelihood, our jobs, our future. Uh, a small group in Washington however newly arrived and however full of themselves at this point, cannot lead this nation over a cliff. That cannot happen. And so we have to take the kind of action uh, that will be required to keep the American people uh, secure, uh, that we are not being governed week to week like a third world nation, but in fact the preeminent economic, cultural, and social leader of the world has got to act like it is, and that's what requires action. No more walking away. No more of pulling out. Get the job done and get America back to work is what the public wants to see. We'll take questions. I think that the uh, dark uh, cloud of uncertainty uh, with the debt ceiling only being still hanging over everyone's head, what our caucus is adamantly clear on, and you heard Jim Clyburn say this, and what we're recommending to the President, if by chance the Republicans come up with the votes on their own and there is a short-term deal that goes to the President's desk, he has said he'll veto that. I know he'll have great, grave concern uh, about that because of uh, uh, the ramifications of what it means for the United States for the first time ever in its history to default on its full faith and credit, which is why Jim Clyburn articulated to the applause of our caucus that the President ought to have his pen right next to it to sign into effect, uh, invoke the 14th Amendment, and uh, make sure that that debt is taken care of. Clean, clean, clean increases. So would you take a short-term increase if it was just clean? We'd have, to, we'd have to see what it looked like, but we're not if it continues to postpone or put the debt off. How does that do anything for certainty in the economy? That we're going to take this up in 30 days, 90 days, you know, 120 days? What does that do to the markets? What does it do to people's uncertainty? What does it do to job creation? If it's, uh, you know, we keep on repeating Groundhog Day, that we go back and convene in meetings and people walk away and they can't get a, reach a decision, it's time to act. What did you hope that they're going to, the White House is even going to consider this? They seem very adamant that they have no intention to invoke the 14th Amendment. What, what makes you think that now they would change their mind? because this is the administration of hope. You, you ask me what gives me hope. With, with the White House that we're unaware of since uh, this morning, I mean, the Daily Mail was very clear in the paper this morning that the President has no... Well, I think as, uh, and I'll let Jim and Javier speak, but uh, I think as the leader indicated, uh, we're getting down uh, to a decision, uh, decision time. Uh, we don't know. Uh, what the other side is going to do. They've walked away from everything, including their own leaders' proposals. So, yes, we would prefer a clean vote, a clean debt ceiling vote. Put that aside so that we can get back to the work of putting America back to work, focus on our deficits, focus on uh, the job creation that we need to have, uh, and move the country forward. That's what we would prefer. We don't know whether or not that will happen. We don't know whether or not there will be a clean vote. But if something passes and it's on his desk, we do know that he can have this. Now, he has taken, as you heard Jim say, uh, a position on this already. But uh, circumstances could change. We just want to let him know that his caucus is prepared to stand behind him. Do you think he's going to 
Not necessarily, but will Senator Reid's plan come over here? We've got to keep as many options as we can, Deidre. We hope that, uh, that you know, listen, uh, will Boehner's plan succeed? Do any of you know? We don't. We certainly don't know. Uh, and if Boehner's plan doesn't see, succeed, it's assumed that uh, this will give Harry Reid the opportunity to send a plan over here because there is not many alternatives. And with a Harry Reid plan, would probably pass here with more than 180 Democratic votes. Uh, to go to the president. Can I, can I just add something? I, I, when the president says he's not interested in invoking the 14th Amendment, I think the president say, I'm not in interested in being the first in the history of this country of doing something that is, has not been tested. Clearly, the, the 14th Amendment says that our debts are valid, and therefore we, live, we will live and, uh, and follow through with pain. We will honor them. We will pay them. The, we're, the Republicans have taken us into the twilight zone. The, we've never been here before. And just as I don't believe George Bush wanted to ask the Congress and the American public to bail out Wall Street, we needed to do something to deal with a catastrophe that was going to hit so hard on the average American family. And so did the President believe that the Republicans would take us into the twilight zone a week away from D-Day? I don't think so. If we get to D-Day, will any president have ever experienced what Barack Obama sitting in the White House will be experiencing? No. Just as no one will experience what Lincoln did or what Washington did or Roosevelt and so forth. They, they have to make the call. And I believe what we're saying to the president is don't let a manufactured crisis by House Republicans drive us deeper into the twilight zone when we can walk out of the twilight zone. Warren Buffett will walk out of the twilight zone, but the average American family will not walk out clean from this twilight zone. And so the president will do, just as the president took out Osama bin Laden in a way that some presidents wouldn't have done it, he's going to have to do something. And we're saying to him, Mr. President, the Republicans through their failure have given you license to do whatever it takes to not let the American family go down the, into that abyss with House Republicans. In short, in short, he will not allow the Republicans to hold the American people hostage, which is what they're doing. So, so you, to be clear, did you say that, that a majority of House Democrats would support the Reid plan, a plan that contains no new revenue and billions of dollars in cuts? Yes. So does that mean that, that you're, you're giving up on the, on the balanced approach in favor of no, 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 whoa, 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 you know, that's why we, you know, this is like deja vu all over again. Okay, let's go back and start where we were, what we're for, okay? Uh, we were for and agreed that, you know, the big approach uh, probably was the best approach <laughs> and would get uh, the greatest number of Democratic uh, uh, of votes, okay? Those uh, negotiations... They walked away from every single subsequent phase of any negotiation between Republican leaders, nonpartisan between Republicans and Democrats, even within their own caucus, they have walked away with. We are in the minority. We are faced with very few alternatives. What we said is given the alternatives of a Boehner plan or a Reed plan, we would vote for the Reed plan. Now, not all Democrats may vote for the Reed plan, but a vast majority of Democrats would vote for the Reed plan. Let me say something about the Reed plan. I think, I think we are neglecting to deal with the fact that we as Democrats believe that politics is an art of the possible. It is all about compromise. And the Reed Plan is a big compromise. Yes, the Reed Plan takes revenue off of the table. The Reed Plan also takes entitlements off of the table. Neither one of those 
we were big on entitlements, they were big on revenues, all that washes away. What it does do is provide for around $2.4 or $5 trillion in cuts. And remember, as a member of the Biden group, he takes those cuts that we discuss and put those into his plan. And so uh, he also uh, provides for uh, a 12-member commission uh, to study uh, debt relief uh, as well as deficit reduction going forward. So all of that's in the read plan, and that's what we say we agree to. So I, uh, but it, it is a long-term extension, and that's where we are. Well, I don't you know, entice him or reserve him from other conversations directly to the White House to try to encourage him to go that direction if, if it, it has to go that way? I speak with the White House often. Have you spoken with them today, though? No, I've not spoken to him today. Do you plan to tell them the good news about how the Congress went? <laughs> They're in our caucus. They have representatives there all the time. So I'm sure they are very much aware not only of already. what Jim had to say, uh, but the way it was received. And the leader was in the room as well and heard very clearly what he had to say. She uh, also said, look, the president has been very clear that he would not like to go this option, where he's, and he's been very clear about that. What we're saying is, if a small group really is that intent on destroying government and is intent on saying they don't believe that any, there's any ramifications for their irresponsibility, then we have to have a fail-safe mechanism. We believe that fail-safe mechanism is the 14th Amendment and the President of the United States. Would you rather have him or would you rather have him have him We'd rather have everybody coming together and focused on a clean uh, uh, bill and, and get on with the, the uh, creating jobs. That's what we think needs to be done. How many Democrats, Last um, question. How many Democrats will vote for the Boehner plan? For the Boehner plan? Boehner plan. Well, we <laughs> for a better question would be how many Republicans does he have? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, and uh, they haven't been able to put their own people together, and so... Uh, I don't think, the, uh, it, given what uh, Jim Clyburn already said, especially with the assault on Medicare and Social Security, uh, with uh, uh, the uh, uh, drastic uh, cuts that they will be doing with no balance or revenues in it, uh, very little votes will be there. I know it's all cloaked as a uh, balanced amendment, but even the CBO and others that have looked at it says it really doesn't even do that. Thank you.